Welcome to the Draft Deeper Podcast. This is your host, Nathan Grubel. Joining me as always is my producer, Kevin Black. We are recording this show on a Monday, Monday, November 1st. That means that Tyler Rucker, a.k.a. Backcourt V, is also joining me. Tyler, how you doing? I'm doing good. I'm pretty pumped about this uh, this show, especially with this guest we got. That's that's more so, even more so why I'm excited, because we have from the Locked On Network founder of NBA Draft Junkies, we have Mr. Rafael Barlow joining us for tonight's episode. It's only fitting because we're talking about top international prospects heading into 2022. This is this man's wheelhouse. He's already done so much work over at NBA Draft Junkies, getting up a bunch of YouTube reports on basically everybody we're going to be talking about tonight. So if you haven't checked out his work, I'll let him plug more of that in a second. But Raphael, how you doing, my friend? I'm good, man. How are you? First of all, thanks for having me on. Thanks for having me on as a guest. It's always, uh, it's always a pleasure. It, it's, it's an honor to do more work with you, my friend. You are one of the hardest working people in this business. I'm so thrilled for everything you've been able to do with Locked On, all of your work that you've done recently, especially dating back to the, the end of the 2021 draft cycle with Chad Ford. I'm, I'm so happy for you, man. You seriously are one of the hardest working people in the business. So just in case somebody doesn't know your work or where they can find you, enlighten anyone. And, and that, that, that's a small amount of people at this point. Because you're awesome for what you do, but enlighten my, my audience about where they can find you, everything that you're doing right now. Yeah, you can find me on my podcast on Mondays and Thursdays on Locked On NBA Draft, and then um, my YouTube channel, NBA Draft Junkies, and then my website also has a lot of the same content. Beautiful. So, boys, let's jump right into it. Top 2022 international prospects i wanted to start with the guy who has me the most intrigued to be perfectly honest nikola jovic six foot ten forward listed at 205 pounds right now a lot of the measurements and weights that i'm using for today's podcast i got those off of real gm really really interesting prospect and and obviously when, when you first flip on the tape the it immediately stands out his feel for the game, right? He makes the right reads as a passer. He can deliver the ball at a variety of angles. He can make the hit ahead, skips to the corner. Looks like in time, he may even be able to run some inverted pick and roll with the right partner. Rafael, I know that you already pointed it out um, on one of your video breakdowns that you've already done on Mr. Jovic. I I'm, I'm personally sold on the jump shot mechanics. He's a tad slow in the windup, but I think the follow through is pretty consistent. And when he hits, I know Tyler and I have mentioned this multiple times, when, when you get those swish makes, that's something we're always here for. He's an instinctual player off the ball as well. He knows where he needs to be, positions himself for, for offensive rebounds. He understands spacing. Um, he, he's, he's another one of those guys, you want him making quick decisions with the ball. He's not someone you want holding and doing everything off of a live dribble. He doesn't have that upper tier of burst. He's not the most elite level athlete. I don't know if he has all of the moves and counter moves to consistently break somebody down 1v1, but he's shown some really interesting shooting upside off of the bounce when he is able to create separation. He can hit an open jump shot. He's aggressive and sometimes relentless driving to the basket. He had a few plays during the U19s where they, they kind of make you leap out of your seat. And you go, holy hell, what, what just happened? What exactly am I watching? And, and I wrote this down on his best days. He can look like a forward version of Jokic, right? Nikola Jokic, our, our 2020 NBA MVP on his worst days. He looks like he's a step slow for the league and the jumper isn't quite ready to translate, but even more so than like a poor man's Jokic type of comparison, the most interesting one that stood out to me, and Rafa, I want to get your thoughts on this. I'll kick it over to you first, and since the, the, you're our honored guest. He reminds me, I have a lot of the same thoughts about him that I had about Denny Avdia when, when, when he was coming into the 2020 draft. Where are you at, Rafael, on, on Jovic as a whole, and do you think that he's a comparable prospect um, in terms of talent level to Avdia, is he maybe a little bit higher? Is he a little bit lower? Where where would you rate him in terms of his comparison? What do you think about his game overall? Well, I like him a lot. I really do. Um, I mean, I thought Avdia was a should have been a, a top five pick at the time. 
I still don't think he's being used correctly in Washington. Um, I think Avdi is more of a point forward than than Jovic, but I think Jovic is a better scorer. I mean, he's, he's obviously a better shooter than Avdi was. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, he's also more offensive minded as far as putting the ball in the basket and scoring Avdia more so. Did a lot of his work at when I saw his film as a point forward and someone that was a really good cutter. And at best was a, at very best was a streaky shooter. I think Jovic is more so of a scorer than shooter. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't have Jovic right now as a top 10 pick, but that, that could change. But then again, I haven't seen all the freshmen play, and it's, he's kind of – depends on how you look at it. He could be at an advantage or a disadvantage because we have, you know, maybe six or seven games of sample size while some of these yep. freshmen haven't played a game and they're rated higher than him. But as of right now, um, I have him, like, right outside the top ten. But I do have him in the lottery. What would he have to do, in your opinion, Rafael? What, what, are, what are one or two things that you would want to see more of on tape and or in the numbers as far as efficiency is concerned to maybe solidify himself into like that top 10 upcoming. And I know we don't have all the thoughts on, you know, some of the returning players like Jay Nivey might take a step, all the freshmen, but what, what in your mind could he do to solidify himself more in that top 10 range than he is now? Um, obviously become a more consistent shooter and then showing better efficiency as far as finishing in the half court. I do think that, especially at the U19s, he showed some flashes of being a ball stopper. Um, there were some times where I, I jokingly made a comparison that he looks like he has a little bit of Jason Tatum in his game, which is very rare for an international prospect. But he does have, um, he, well, he does show some tendency to kind of break the offense and go one on one, especially if he has someone on him in the in the mid post. That could be a good or or a bad thing. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the main thing is that, um, you know, just as far as like, uh, better shot selection, uh, even though he is a good passer, like I said, he does have a tendency to just kind of be a ball stopper and look for contested near range pull-ups. And then, um, of course, finishing at the rim because I, although he's a, he's a good athlete. I mean, he has some highlights where he dunked on guys but he needs like a runway so it's just more so like is he going to be a good finisher at the rim in the half court Tyler, i know that you and i have already been talking a little bit back and forth and in, in, in our dms on twitter and also with a few of our guys over at no ceilings a little bit and you and i are very intrigued by him i don't know where you're at right now in terms of how you view his draft stock, but are there any other takeaways to his game that you want to throw in on top of what Raphael and I have already talked about and where are you kind of at on him stock wise? I think Raphael said it completely perfect. You know, it's, it's so early in the year. We haven't seen a lot of these freshmen play, you know, we're just basically trying to get a grasp of these guys trying to see where they're going to improve. If, if we can get them on a little bit of a consistent level now, I'm like a lot of guys. I still think Jovic could be a little bit of a darling of the draft world, you know, throughout the year. But, you know, exactly what Rafael said, it's one of those we need to see some more consistency. He just reminds me of a guy that is going to be able to do a lot of things good in a variety of levels in the game. You know what I'm saying? But I would like to see the outside shot come around a little bit more consistent, you know? But, um, no, I, I agree with everything. It's just so early, but you can see the tools, you know, 6'10". Um, he's got some intriguing playmaking ability. I mean, there's a lot to like, but still young. You know, I think draft day, he'll be around 19 years old, just turning 19. So a lot of upside, a lot of intrigue, but still very early. Tyler, are you concerned at all? even a little bit about the defense. Like to me, I, I wrote this down too. He, he's, he's, he seems very upright to me, which mm -hmm. I think holds him back a little bit defensively. He's not someone who's going to recover 
very well. The positive is that he does recognize plays defensively most of the time, and he can like beat guys to a spot, and and he can contest around the basket. Like a lot of the ways where we were talking about, maybe we're concerned about Shingun's defense a little mm-hmm. bit because of some of the same things. Shingun's still a very high IQ type of defensive player. He can recognize things and still have some level of an impact. Like Jovic, I think, can do that as well. But he, he he's, again, he's not someone you want out on an island on the perimeter, and he's likely going to be playing more of the four spot than just kind of standing around trying to figure himself out and pick and roll coverages and then ultimately protecting the rim down low. So I wonder a little bit about where is he going to find a home defensively? How might something like that take minutes away from him? Are you concerned about that area of the floor for him at all? I, I think it's still early, but I think, you know, going with the outside shot and defense, like that's that's the two areas I think we need to all see a little bit more consistency over time. And, you know, that's the thing with international prospects is they usually hone down on intelligence and knowing where to be with rotations and team defense. So it, it's going to be something to monitor with Jovic. I'm, it's still so early that I'm not overly worried about anything, you know, I, I, like. I think the shot looks fine. I think it's going to progress throughout the year. His defense, I, I think, is going to be fine too. He's just got the length and size to potentially guard multiple positions. But you know, we're we're going to wait and see if he can kind of push the needle forward in any area and try to make a little bit of noise as one of the guys that should climb up draft boards. He's just one of these players we see come into the draft time and time again where we know how high level of an IQ this man has. And I think that he also combines that with a level of confidence that's sort of a little bit above and beyond what he's fully capable of on like an NBA court right now. And he like he in in these games that he's in, he tries different things. And I think sometimes he tries to show a little too much. Like I know Raphael was just talking about that. Sometimes he, he, it's not that he can't make the correct decision with the ball in his hands, but he'll look for shot opportunities and difficult shot opportunities, contested shot opportunities. I think because he thinks that he can do all of these things when in reality, if he just took the time to slow down, maybe a half step in how he's processing and seeing everything on the court and maybe just trusted making a different decision uh, again, along with slowing down. I think we might see. And more of that on t- all three of us have just pointed out how much skill this guy has um, certainly on the offensive end of the floor. So I think when, when, when you're trying to balance something or, or I won't even call it an issue, but something like that, versus the opposite, like a guy isn't assertive at all, and you're trying to just drag all of that talent and skill out of him on a nightly basis, I think that more so is where you run into issues than what we've seen on film with Jovic. So I'm really excited to continue to see him develop. He's he's probably the the international prospect I'm the most high on on who we're going to talk about today. But Rafael, I know that you also made a really positive film breakdown uh, ahead of this 2022 cycle on Yannick Sosa. You are pretty high on him. Maybe not like you still think that he's like this awesome, like top five or top three pick, but you highlighted a lot of positives, a lot of things that he can do. And like already when, when you flip on the tape, his athleticism stands out in spades, right? He's a freak athlete at the center position, great open floor speed, quickness stands out, slipping off screens. He moves his feet well in general. He's a leaper for sure. Pick and roll threat for days because of all of those things. But there's a lot to like. There are some negatives before I go any further into some of my thoughts. Raphael, why don't you enlighten my audience as to what you've already seen on the film and why you did want to put out something to speak highly of this young man leading into this draft cycle? Yeah, I mean, coming into this season, I was really high on him. I'll be honest, so far, like the production as of now hasn't met my expectations Mm -hmm. Um, he's playing behind a guy that's actually a friend of mine and Michael Eric. Funny story. I was, I was at a wedding with Michael. Um, I want to say it was like in in August, maybe like right after a couple of weeks after summer league. And we were sitting there at the wedding and um, he says, Oh man, I got a, I got a deal. I said, okay, where are you going? (laughs) And then he told me, I was like, Oh man, you're going to, are you and Sosa going to play together? And he was just like, (laughs) He was like, I don't know. And I was thinking like, you know, because 
the ACB in Spain is not really a developmental league. It, it's a league where, you know, it's competitive. There's not a lot of developmental yep. minutes. And mm-hmm. so I, I just knew right then and there that that he was Sosa was going to have some trouble as far as earning minutes. And then um, he got off. I think he had like a, a injury, so he missed some of camp. So he really hasn't really earned the minutes that I that I expected. Um, right now, his defense is ahead of his offense. Um, I mean, it's just his his frame is is a concern. Can he put on can he put on weight? But as far as just in the end speed, man, I, I love how he transitions from defense to offense. I mean, he can alter a shot and then be the first man back to to run the floor. So I just I think that defensively, as far as defending his space, I mean, he's I mean, his his potential is off the charts. But yep. he's gonna play the five, he's gonna need to bulk up and put on some weight which means it could be a, a, a process. So he may have to start off playing the four, and I don't know if he really has the skill set right now. To, you know, not like in Evan Mobley, where you know Mobley can, you know, he's not going to be a post threat right away because he lacks strength, but he does mm-hmm. have some other things that he brings to the table. And right now I don't see that in Sosa, but I, I made a, a joke saying that he is like, the most raw prospect that I've ever seen that's like raw, but he's like polished at the same time, if that makes sense. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So he's has decent touch. He's not like fumbling, you know, like, you know, just going down. I mean, he's, he's agile. He seems like the learning curve for him has been pretty, pretty fast. So he seems like a quick learner and he's picked up things pretty fast, but there are times where he shows that he's, he's raw, but, um, I like his touch as far as just being a a guy that can make soft touch finishes around the basket. So you mentioned the, the name Mobley, Rafael. I want to get back to that. I have a specific question, my friend, that I wrote down that I wanted to ask you because you've watched them defensively more than I have. Um, some of these young bigs that come into the NBA again, their bodies aren't their bodies aren't fully filled out. They're they're still kind of finding their way physically, and then obviously from a mental standpoint, processing the game on that end as well. Do you think he'll struggle early on as the majority of bigs do with, with racking up fouls because you don't see that level of discipline from him yet defensively? Or do you think there, because of his athletic ability, because of his physical skill set and his tools, that maybe there, there's a little bit more that he'll be able to get away with compared to some of the other bigs that are coming into the NBA? How do you feel about his feel on defense? Uh, I think it's okay. I mean, I think that he's going to struggle. Um, I think he's more so of a long-term project than somebody that's going to come in and 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 plug and play. Um, yeah, I'd see. You know, even like he could be on like the Mo Bamba timeline. You know, everybody was kind of disappointed in Bamba the first couple of years, but he's starting to show flashes this year. He's showing be- big flashes this year. <laughs> yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if 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 you know they're on a similar timeline. And if you know he's a top five pick, then the expectations are going to be higher, and people aren't going to be as patient with him as if he were like the fifteenth pick. So I mentioned that at at the top because of a lot of his coordination, because of his speed, his, his quickness, his ability to move his feet and operate at different angles. He's a pick and roll threat for days. Well, I personally am not in love with what I'm seeing uh, in terms of like his lack of bodying up and absorbing contact set on, on set screens, which again is, is common to see from somebody like him. He still has to fill out his frame. He has to be more comfortable initiating and then taking contact. There's no question though that he understands how and when to slip for the easy finish around the basket. He's very coordinated. He even has, as Rafael was talking about his touch, he has a nice lefty floater um, that he can go to that, that that's there to help um, when, when somebody does try and come up and play, contest a shot at the rim. He can go to that little floater, and then when he is able to slip past the defense and somebody doesn't come over to help and they don't know he's coming because of how fast he's actually moving, he can finish at the basket. He can go up, he can catch a lob, et cetera. Um, but... He has zero right hand to speak of, which is really interesting. Like everything he does is completely lefty from finishing to handling the ball, etc. There's an argument to be made. He doesn't have to necessarily be elite with both hands, given how quick he is um, and, and his ability to get around defenders. But he does have to be a threat to dribble and mix it up with his right, at least a little bit, right? So there are some differences between his handle. He doesn't exactly have a game right now. Um, 
We brought up the name Evan Mobley, but in Zosa's case, we haven't seen the same perimeter flashes to his game. He dribbles exclusively with his left. His jump shot's theoretical at this point, along with making reads and delivering passes on a dime. Like Without that ability to face up and impact the game from the outside like Mobley, Tyler, are teams still going to be willing to spend a top five pick on someone like Zosa and talk themselves into how much upside he has? you know, given the things he can do well and already has a feel for. I, I think it's one of those areas, you know, he was one of those names before even the international process, like season got underway that was buzzing and everyone was talking about Yannick. Everyone was, you know, just the idea of him is it's fantastic. You know, you're talking about a big that runs the floor like a wing and he looks incredible getting up and down the floor and some of the stuff he can do on defense, like, yeah, it's easy to fall in love quickly. And now, you know, Raphael hit it on it. The, the production just really hasn't been there. So if it if it kind of trends that way, I think you're talking about exactly what he said. It, it just might be a big that's a bit more of a project than some people might be realizing. And there's nothing wrong with that. It, it just might take a much longer time for the tools to all come together and you know, I, I think we all fascinate with bigs, but sometimes the truth is they all click at different times. They all come into their own belief and build confidence at different times throughout their career. So, you know, it, it, it's going to be interesting. Um, I think, you know, I, I've been asking around just curious about what some guys around the league thought about these international prospects. And one guy was like, hey, Yannick's, you know, he's he's got to start – putting up some production just because the way he's trending, he won't be a lottery guy. And it's, it's just, it's tough because he's so young that you can see there's so much upside in talent, but you know, it's just one of those things where he's trying to figure out the game. And um, like, uh, like we've said before, it's so early in the season. I mean, all of a sudden these guys can go on stretches where it's like, okay, we, we can see everything's clicking now. So, you know, what to say what you're saying, I, I just think, he, he's he's a lot more raw, but all of a sudden three stretch game where he's really flashing and putting stuff together, we could all of a sudden be buzzing about Yannick again. I agree, Tyler, and and I talked about him being a threat in pick and roll. He's not a great screen setter right now, and it's it's a pet peeve of mine when bigs aren't physical on on set screens. They don't look to absorb contact well. But we also mentioned Mobley's name and. Look at what he's doing in the league right now, slipping screens into so much space. He's not physical on that aspect of his game either, but it's amazing what happens when you have so much room to operate in the lane and then use your coordinated footwork and speed to your advantage around the basket. I mean, the other nitpick with his game is on the defensive end as well. You know, Coach Spinell over at the box of one put together a clip package of one of his games examining his lack of impact and drop coverages against pick and roll sets. And I look at the tape, and a lot of that comes back to the understanding of where and how to play in that coverage, not necessarily a lack of physical ability to be a menace against pick and roll offenses. And Raphael, you did a great job in your video. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think you pointed out he's only been playing basketball at, at a competitive level for like four or five years now, right? That's it, right? Yep. Yep. And I talked to uh, Michael, uh, Michael Eric. And so I had, well, actually, people were asking me, was he really. 18 or 17 years old because he does look significantly older than his age and so I was asking Mike if that was true and he just said he says man he is really a kid he said he is you know <laughs> a regular 17 year old kid so um I think that is probably part of the intrigue is because He's still new to the game and he's still learning. And so that's why I think a lot of people may think his upside is, is mm -hmm. off the charts. Um, but honestly, I, I was expecting more this season. I think we're all pretty much in the same boat. But yeah, when you, when you are that young from an age perspective, but also from a competitive basketball playing perspective, both of those things 
do weigh heavily in his favor. So I still think there's a chance that his name buzzes right back up again, especially if some of these other freshmen or returning players, if some of these other guys don't exactly live up to the expectations we've already set for them. And we're looking for prop somebody else back up. You just, you look at Zosa's physical tools and his package and what he could bring to the table, you know, two, three, four years into an NBA career. And you start talking yourself back into playing into that upside. So I'll be, I'll be really interested to see a, if he can turn his play around and b monitoring the stock of everybody else. See if he just kind of jumps back up higher into the picture naturally moving into somebody who we thought was going to enter the 2020 uh, 2021 NBA draft. He actually pulled his name. He withdrew his name and we would all expect him to be firmly in the mix in 2022. Rocco Prakasin, um, the forward out of uh, KK Sabona, 6'9", 234 pounds, excellent size and build for a wing in the NBA. He has a multitude of skills he can go to in his bag. He's a creative finisher in transition. He's an adept cutter off the ball. He can hit open spot up shots. He can pass on the move. With that being said though, and this is really what I struggle with a lot in 2020. So Tyler, I'll come to you in a second. I really want to get your perspective um, on Prakasin, but I can't point to one thing he does and say that it's a standout skill that that's excellent or elite, right? Like I'm starting to come around on his athleticism and how much that'll factor um, into his production in the NBA, but I don't love the shooting mechanics overall. And even, even this year, right, right away, he's still not shooting well from the foul line. Hitting open shots is something that he can do, but I don't trust his ability to create and hit shots off the bounce. Like his game screams role player to me, possibly high end glue guy, but like not more than a third option. And like that would still put him in like a tier three category for me if I'm breaking a lot of these guys out in tiers in this draft. But I question someone like him, like taking someone like him in the lottery definitively. Um, I know we had a lot of fans on draft Twitter last year. I think people are still fairly high on him coming into this cycle. Tyler, what were some of your thoughts on Rocco heading into last year's draft? And 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 what, what's like your temperature check on him right now at this current moment? No, I, I'll, this was one of the guys I was most excited to talk about, especially with Raphael. I mean, I don't know what Raphael thought of him last year, but I know there's a lot of people on, if you want to say draft Twitter or just fans of the draft that, thought he should have been a early lottery guy. And I, I thought that was a little rich for my taste. Um, I'm intrigued with the skills. Like he seems like a potential versatile, you know, forward that has, a, I'm intrigued by the playmaking upside. I don't know why I can't get it out of my head. I, I've just seen some flashes with some of the passes he makes that I'm kind of like, okay, is there, is that a talent that's waiting to come, come to the surface, you know, but um, I'm like you, Nathan. I, I, I think there's a, I don't think there's like superstar or star upside. I think there's just a really good basketball player that might be able to be a versatile asset on, you know, both sides of the ball potentially. Um, I, I think we're probably talking about outside of the lottery, um, this year, unless he just goes on an absolute tear, um, He's had some impressive performances this year, but you know, a lot of these guys, we just we want to see some consistency. And I think that's the same thing with Rocco. So um, no, I'll be interested to see what Raphael thinks. I mean, this is one of those guys that I'm, I'm glad he gambled on himself. He went back for another year. He believes in himself, but it'll be interesting to see at the end of the day, if it was worth it. Raphael, I want to get your thoughts on a comparison here for Rocco. I can't, I can't get this name out of my head on the offensive end, not not the defensive end, but offensively. When I go back and think of players who are the same archetype of like a jack of all trades, but master of none, I go back to Andre Iguodala before the shooting outburst when he was with the Golden State Warriors. So we're talking pre-Golden State Warriors, Denver Nuggets, and back. And at his best, he was a role player who could impact the game, making the right reads to get others the ball. He was a really good scorer inside the arc who wanted to finish over and through defenses. And you see some of that same aggression from Rocco as he's playing overseas. But there wasn't, to me, that one elite, elite skill 
that he had that, that I would definitely stamp firmly on his resume. De- defensively is where Iguodala really made a name for himself, and I think that allowed him to play through some offensive inefficiencies, and I don't expect Rocco to have a similar impact on that end. But just speaking offensively, what do you think about that comparison? And do you see a similar outcome offensively for Rocco in the league with, with Golden State Iguodala kind of being his upside if everything breaks right for him? Well, I thought Iggy was more so of a point forward. So I felt like that was the one skill that he could hang his hat on was that he could be a you know, guy that could initiate the offense. And then we knew that he had the athleticism to, you know, to be a, a multi-positional defender. Mm-hmm. I think he had more of a, I guess you can say, defined role despite being like a master of none. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Rocco. I, but I, I do agree that I think Rocco is, I mean, he's just going to be a, a, a role player, which I think is totally fine. I mean, even if you go through the lottery, I mean, you can go through the last 20 lotteries, the majority of the guys that were selected in the lottery end up being role players. So, um, yeah, I mean, I definitely think that's his his role in the NBA guy that just kind of does a a little bit of everything. I'm trying to think of a comparison right now. It's hard, um, right? Yeah, it's hard because you know, you don't want to make the lazy comparison and compare him to, you know, another international player. So mm-hmm. I haven't really thought about who to compare him to, but I, I think it's intriguing. I think he's so young that um you have to, you know, consider his upside. I would like to see him play excuse me, outside of Sabona. Like, um, Mm -hmm. I haven't seen in the past few years him playing on, like, the national team. I haven't seen, um, you know, I mean, I don't think they're playing. I don't know if his team is playing in any other league. Are are they in the Euro Cup? I'm not sure. I can't think off the top of my head. They may only just be playing in the domestic league. I don't don't think they're in the Euro Cup. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, just want to see him against different competition. But I think his skill set is intriguing. Like I said, I mean, he does a little bit of everything well. I mean, he's, you know, a decent shooter, but he can attack closeouts. Um, unfortunately, the game against Jovic was a game that I had circled on my calendar as like a must-see game, and they both kind of disappointed. All of a sudden, I think combined, they may have only scored like 10 points or something like that in their early season matchup. So, mm-hmm. um but yeah, I, I like him a lot. So you you brought up a point that I kept on bringing myself back to last year when I was trying to evaluate him for 2021 was that the competition level that he's playing. Like, do you think there's any sort of fool's gold to some of the things that we see on the tape? Just how elite of an athlete really is this guy? Like when he comes and he plays competition more up to like an NBA standard or like a like a high level college standard, like is he still like a really good athlete? Is he only a good athlete? Does he end up standing out as much on tape as he is um, playing for Sabona? Like what are some of your thoughts from from that perspective at Rafael when you watch him on tape? Yeah, I mean he he definitely will be an average, maybe slightly above average athlete at best. Yep. Um, but I think that he kind of makes up for it with how he plays. He plays hard. He definitely um, has a, a versatile skill set that I think can make up for what he lacks in elite athleticism. But, you know, I mean, I, I sometimes I think we kind of overrate athleticism because, I mean, you look at the guy that was the MVP last year, he probably can't <laughs> jump over a sheet of paper. And he dominates with, you know, with, with his IQ and, and, and skill set, not saying that Rocco is is um, Jokic as far as skill set, but I think you know, like if he has a high IQ and and he can you know just kind of think the game, it can make up for what he lacks in athleticism. But I would have loved to see him in like an under nineteen playing against Team USA or a, a team from France or Canada where they have other high level athletes so we could see how he, he measures up. So Tyler, I think we we've all kind of laid out that we think that he he's going to be a role player in the NBA, that that's really the, the type of value that we see for him. 
this sort of comes back to an interesting draft philosophy question a little bit, right? Like how high are you comfortable drafting someone who you're, you're pigeonholing in as like a third, fourth option. You don't really see any sort of pathway to him necessarily climbing any higher than that, or, 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 or maybe you do in his case, but I, I personally don't. I think that's, that's right where I would project him to be like three, four years down the line. Like how comfortable are you personally drafting a, with, with, with like a, a high to mid high lottery pick um or, or does that player slide for you a little bit and and do you mainly kind of see him as like a guy maybe he's like mid to late first round but how do you project that kind of player fantasize that like if you're drafted in the lottery you have to become the star and, and of course we get a little bit you know nba teams get lucky because you know the draft is about luck you you you're investing what you believe in and sometimes guys don't work out sometimes they work out perfectly and you hit a home run but you know, if you could draft a guy late lottery or even outside of that, that you're, you know, two or three years down the road, you're like, man, we have a really nice third option. I mean, I think a lot of teams would be pretty pumped about that, you know. So is Rocco going to be that guy? I mean, it's too early to say, but, you know, there's definitely a lot of parts of his games that you're intrigued with, um, you know, as Rafael hinted before. He he just plays he plays hard. He he he's a tough little kid that got a good frame on him. I think he's gonna bring it every night if he's given the opportunity. So, um, yeah, I I I think it, he's gonna be worth it if you're getting outside of the lottery. I think the lottery might be a little rich for my taste, especially you know it's early, but this looks like it could potentially be another strong class. So I'm not. Sure, I'm going to say Rocco is going to be a guy that I'm taking 12 or 13th, but um, I definitely see him as a guy that if you got him somewhere in the late first round, you'd be pretty, pretty excited about maybe the upside of him being a nice complimentary piece moving forward. Well, I, I agree with the statement about we think guys that are selected in the lottery are supposed to be stars, but. Mm -hmm. Let, let's use a guy like P.J. Washington, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was, he was a lottery pick. He was a 12th pick in the draft. I don't think he's going to end up being a star. Mm -hmm. I think that in a redraft, he still may end up in the same in the same position. <laughs> so mm -hmm. if, if Rocco ends up being P.J. Washington, that's not a bad choice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's not. I, I think Charlotte Hornets fans, they're, they're enjoying a lot of success they've had with, with, with P.J. Washington. I talked about um, the Hornets on this podcast. So, no, I, I agree with you guys wholeheartedly, and I'm glad that we were able to wrap a little of that conversation back into draft philosophy. So, moving on, let's talk about Usman Dieng, um, New Zealand Breakers wing listed at 6'9", 185 pounds. Confidence is, is definitely abundant. It seems like he's never seen a shot he doesn't like, right? He, he can pull up from mid-range or behind the arc. He can shoot off the catch, curl off screens. There are examples on film of him doing virtually everything you could ask him to do, shooting the basketball. He shoots over defenders because of his 6'9 size. He doesn't shoot the ball from a low point, but he doesn't get a ton of arc on his shots. The form isn't pretty. And as a result, but he'll, he'll get it to work, right? I, I would love to see him put some more arc on it and angle his release more upward versus pushing the ball at the rim. But nevertheless, he's he's comfortable mechanically where he's at right now. So we'll, we'll see this season exactly how those mechanics further translate. We'll see if there's any more consistency there, if he has to do a little bit more work on his shot. Um, he does make good decisions when he sees the play unfolding on offense. Don't know how much responsibility I want him to have making multiple reads off a live dribble, but he can make the basic passes off a drive and kick or to a cutter along the baseline, right? I, I don't have the confidence of him to deliver the ball on, on skips to the corner or make more advanced reads out of pick and roll or other play types like that, but I, I do have at least a basic trust level there of him to make some of the easy plays, which is great. That gives him a little bit of playmaking upside. Really lanky frame. And I'm not confident he's going to fill out his body terribly well. Narrow shoulders and torso don't leave a ton of room to fill out. 
but I'll imagine he'll get stronger and probably top out around, you know, 210, 215 ish, somewhere in there when all is said and done as far as playing weight is concerned. But a lack of, you know, bulk to his frame, strength, those two things right now inhibit his finishing ability around the basket. He, he can't finish through defenders or convert in traffic. And his lack of elite touch is displayed when he does try and score in the paint because he tries to, you know, float and kiss everything high off the glass with, with mixed results. I mean, the next step in, in scoring around the basket for him will definitely be to get a better understanding of attacking at a different angle to where he can look for better layups versus making everything much tougher on himself. I know that I talked about that when I went through the Charlotte Hornets and, and I went through some of my issues with LaMelo Ball's game. Although there are a few, that was one of the things I pointed to. He kind of does the same thing as well because while he's he's a bigger player, point guard than, than most he, he's bigger in terms of being a guard it's similar to, to Usman even though they both have great size for their positions they don't have the bulk and the strength to them quite yet to finish through defenders so you want to definitely mix up a little bit from an approach standpoint with their finishing around the basket um, I want to watch him defensively in the NBL can he shine enough on that end to be labeled properly as a two-way wing in this class and, and Tyler, this is really where I want to come to you. This is a specific question that I want to ask you. So will he be good enough and efficient enough on both ends of the floor to properly get that two-way wing label? I know Rafael mentioned this in, in his piece that he did on Usman, and I, I've heard this name on, on a few other avenues as far as social media is concerned, the Paul George type name as being a legitimate two-way threat. Obviously, offensively, you get all the perimeter shooting in, in multiple different play types. You get the ability for uh, George to, to go off the dribble, maybe make a few plays for others when, when that's something that needs to be done within the offense. He can go get his own shot, create his own shot, can play off the basketball, is there that legitimate upside with Dang, or are we looking at primarily an inefficient outside shooter who I wouldn't classify maybe as a tier three type of guy, which is more along the lines of how I would classify him if I'd be pushing him more towards the Paul George camp? Are we looking at somebody who I would classify more as a tier four guy, which would be like in the starting lineup technically, but more of like a specialist, but the numbers don't necessarily back up that he's going to be a, a definite shooting specialist to bet on either. Like we're still making a pretty significant bet that those numbers will improve across the board really as he gets more experience. So that's what I want to come back to Tyler what type of prospect do you think he's going to be in the league? Which way should we lean, at least at this point in the evaluation process for 2022? I think the the upside is fantastic. You know, um, you're talking about great size, really young. You know, I, I know I made a joke on it on draft Twitter. It seems like he's listed everywhere from 6'7 to 6'9, but it seems like it, everyone's saying he's 6'9. But, um, He's got some creativity off the dribble. Um, nice little shot, some intriguing footwork as, you know, creator. I just, I'm going to be fascinated because I know he's been buzzing as a guy that scouts are going to be wanting to see, but I, I'm going to be fascinated how he handles the NBL. And, you know, I was most excited tonight to talk to you guys about these next two prospects we're going to talk about because, um, I think Deang could struggle a little bit to get adjusted to the NBL just on both sides with his frame, but I'm not saying he won't figure it out. I just think the frame, how young he is, he could just struggle to get his feet wet. And I'm not, like I said, that's not a bad thing. You know, guys have struggled previously over there and taken their time to get used to the physicality. You know, RJ Hampton wasn't, you know, putting up eye opening numbers right out of the gate, but it just takes some time, but I, I, I'm more excited about Deang the more I watch him than I thought I was going to be at first. And um, I think it's just because you can see what the tools could become if it all comes together. But with most of these guys, we want to see some more efficiency. So um, I'm a fan. I'm, a, I'm intrigued. I'm going to be watching those games closely. 
Raphael, I know that Tyler uh, Tyler was just talking about some points to the league that he's going to be playing in and, and what he might envision from him this year. And I know that you, you think of the NBL, you think of Australia and New Zealand, and, and, and you want to envision, you know, really physical type pro league. I, I get mixed responses in terms of when I talk to other people about the actual level of physicality. Some people think that it is really physical. Some people think that it, it, it's physical, but not like as to the emphasis that some people are, are putting on it. But I, I agree with Tyler. I think he's definitely going to have some some learning curves in that league. He's going to have his lumps. Where are you at personally at DA right now? Have any of your thoughts changed from, from when you made your breakdown video of him? What kind of prospect do you eventually expect him to be as we head into 2022? You know, honestly, that's a good question because I don't think that he is in the best position to succeed with this uh, with this Breakers team. I mean, it's the same team that RJ Hampton went to, and RJ ended up having to spend a lot of time in the corner. And mm-hmm. RJ was kind of best with the ball in his hands, which I mean, you can say that RJ doesn't really have a defined position anyway, but. Um, I actually went to a, a game in in New Zealand where they where they play Lamelo, and I just kind of saw how RJ was just kind of in the corner, not really involved. He had two guards that were, I mean, very high level pros, and he had to play off the ball. So when I look at at where Dang is going, I mean, I think they have Peyton Siva on the team, and then you got Hugo Besson, who we're going to talk about later on in this podcast. Those guys are going to dominate the ball. So Dang is going to have to play off the ball a lot. Now, is he a spot-up shooter? Is he going to be able to knock down shots as a spot-up shooter? I don't know. That That's a, a concern. That's a question. I mean, he hasn't really been an efficient shooter throughout, you know, the, the limited sample size that we have on him because he hasn't really played a lot of games. So um, I don't know if it's going to be the best fit for him. I've actually seen him play pickup in person. I saw him this summer in L.A., He's really skinny. He's a really mm-hmm. thin frame. And the league is going to be a lot more physical than what he's used to. Um, not a necessarily a knock on French prospects, but they're usually not known for being physical and tough anyway. <laughs> so um, he is, is is going to be one of the more interesting, interesting prospects that I'll be following this year because I could really see the situation dropping his draft stock tremendously because he's not going to put up big numbers. The only guys from Australia that have put up good numbers were primary ball handlers and LaMelo and Giddy. And so I think, um, you know, from RJ to Terrence Ferguson, nobody really put up numbers in Australia. So um, I think his stock takes a hit. Well, Raphael, that's where I was going to go with my next question. Uh, RJ Hampton was at one point a top five projected pick, right? <laughs> Let alone a top 10 player. And he was a lot more naturally talented and athletically gifted, in my opinion, than, than Dang and, and, and his stock. I mean, he fell all the way to 24th in the draft. So if, if that's the type of fall someone like him can have, then, then just how far could, could Dang ultimately fall? Yeah, I mean, I think he can take a significant dive to the point where um, I mean, I may get in trouble for saying this. I, I know RJ, and I'm considered his dad a friend. They actually came on my podcast for Father's Day. So once uh, RJ's dad saw that Jang was was going to play for the Breakers, he reached out to me and asked me, did I know the kid? I said, no, I don't know him. I don't know anybody that can, you know, get me in contact with him. And then randomly I went to LA and I was seeing some guys playing pickleball and he was there and, and I, you know, was able to talk to him. And that was the thing that um, Rod, RJ's dad, wanted to let him know, like, you know, the situation may not be the best for you. You know, he he wanted him to not necessarily hate on the breakers, but just give him a heads up of what to expect and how it could hurt. Because RJ's dad had mentioned that when um, on draft night, he felt like he made the biggest mistake and he felt like he cost RJ millions of dollars and just, you know, made him back big mistake in his career because he was the one that thought Australia was the best fit for him. So um, could be some similarities there, but I mean, I've, I've seen Jang as high as top 10 on some boards <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, I mean, 
especially, you know, considering the fact that he's a six eight, six nine guy that is a wing, and then he's back with he's with CAA. I mean, they're kind of comparing him to Paul George. So I think he's gonna have a buzz there. But um, you know, he he could end up not having good. I don't expect him to have good numbers, but I also wouldn't be shocked if he's a guy that does a a, a Zaire Williams who just kind of wows people in workouts and then the stock goes right back up. So you mentioned the last guy, Raphael, that we are going to talk about on this podcast. And I like choosing someone who I haven't necessarily gotten around, gotten around to studying in depth or I don't have the greatest feel for. I love bringing somebody like that up so that I can be more educated on the prospect in turn as well as my audience. That would be Hugo Besson. Um, I know that Tyler, you're a big fan of his. Raphael, I know that you like him a lot. I'll start out with you, Raphael. Why don't you give my audience a little bit of an intro into who, who, who Hugo Besson is and what we can from his game, where you're at on him. Yeah, Hugo's a guy that I was mad at myself for not being high on earlier or not really knowing much about. Um, once I watched this film, it's kind of like, you know, when you're listening to a, a CD or you download a song and you see the first, or you hear the first three seconds and you already know whether you like the guy or not, this was like, listen, when I watched this film, it was like listening to a song where you immediately fell in love with the beat. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I was, I mean, a fan. I, I thought that he has the offensive creativity, the, the confidence that I like. I mean, he's a shot maker, but he's also a, a pretty good shooter. I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, if he would have played – but one, he led the 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 pro B, the second division in France in scoring. And if he would have played enough games, he may have finished first in three pointers made. And uh, his agent is a a friend of mine. He pretty much runs the whole French national team, and um, they actually, you know, we don't live too far from each other. And he told me, and of course, this is an agent speaking, so of course he's going to be a little bit biased. But he told me that he thinks Hugo is Tyler Hero. He thinks that he's going to have that type of year and that he is predicting him to be a lottery pick when it's all said and done. I mean, he is, I mean, this is a guy that represents Fournier, Gobert, Benyama, and um, and I, he, he's pretty much a straight shooter. Like, I mean, he's been direct with me about some of his other clients, but Hugo is someone that he is extremely high on. And I think that, you know, when he placed him in New Zealand, he he knew that he was putting him in the best situation to succeed because the best, the two best prospects to have come from Australia were primary ball handlers. So um, that's something I'm going to be looking out for. I'm definitely going to see if, if his uh, if his word is good. But he didn't make the Tyler Hero comparison. Well, Tyler Hero, you say that name, all of a sudden my ears immediately perk up. Uh, regardless of who's saying that name, Tyler, what are some of your thoughts that you want to add in uh, about you? You out of this game? How excited are you for to to keep watching him heading into twenty twenty two? No, I, I knew coming on here I was going to like Raphael, especially when he started out with the Denny Avdia love. But um, no, I, I same same exact thing. The more you watch him, I was just like, okay, I am I am a fan. I am I'm in love. Like. I just bought in quickly. I'm intrigued by some of the just some of the confidence and shots he can create. Um it was just one of those guys that you just kept watching and you wanted to watch more. And I that's always someone you you circle when you're evaluating early in the year cuz you're like I want to track them and see how they're going to respond in the upcoming challenge, upcoming season, but um you know, I actually got, I just thought of a question for Raphael. So now I'm going to be Nathan for a second. But um, Raphael, do you think Hugo's probably going to be a better fit for the NBL? Because I know you talked about how you could see his stock climbing a bunch. But I feel like Hugo compared to Deang might thrive in the NBL just because that league might be a little bit better for him. And I know he's a little older and stuff, but I just feel like he could be a perfect kind of transition for that style of play. Oh yeah. Without, without a doubt. 
because he's going to have the ball in his hands. Yeah. And that's, that's like I said, the, the two guys that have really succeeded coming from the NBL had the ball in their hands. And they weren't even, like, the most efficient guys. <laughs> you know what I'm <laughs> saying? Like, um, so, yeah, I think that he'll have the ball in his hands. At worst, he'll be the secondary, but I think he's going to be the main playmaker. He's probably going to – he might even lead his team in scoring. I mean, mm-hmm. he's – just that wired to score again. He's he's stronger than than Jang, and um, so yeah, I I definitely think that it's like you know there are two French guys <laughs> going to the same team in the NBL, but I think their stock is going to go in different directions based off of you know their style of play and and how how the league fits fits to each person differently. Mm-hmm. Well. I know I, for one, am incredibly intrigued, and I'm definitely going to have to go back and, and he go best. I mean, a- every single thing I see on this guy, when we get into, like, uh, I'm searching around on YouTube for different clips or, like, maybe to watch a game or something, like, every single highlight's like, 29 points here, 28 points here, 26 points there. Like, this guy is clearly a major, major bucket getter from the guard spot. He has a pretty good build from what I can tell, solicited at like 6'3", 195 pounds. So he's not he's not terribly small. He's got a little bit to him. I think he can fill out a little bit more. And if he's bringing that kind of three-level scoring ability and he can distribute it, like I said, like Raphael said, he's going to have plenty of opportunities with the ball in his hands on and one of those leagues, sneaky. the NBL. I was just saying, and I think he's a sneaky athlete. Like there's a couple plays where he dunked on somebody, but it wasn't like – you know how, like, every once in a while you see James Harden dunk on somebody, but it's not mm-hmm. like he exploded. It's just kind of like he kept his same stride and just kind of went up and, and you know, just kind of finished like people are surprised. And, and that's kind of how Hugo was, not comparing him to James Harden. But he is like a sneaky, good athlete that, um, you know, can, can make some plays above the rim. I think he was one of the best finishers around the rim in the, in the second division in France last year. So um, I, 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 yeah, he shot 67% around the rim. So um, I, like I said, I think he's a sneaky good athlete because, you know, he gets to the rim obviously. And then um, he's a good finisher there. I'll end the podcast on this. I'll pose this question to both of you guys, Raphael, you first. Who is the international prospect out of all the guys we've talked about today, the five guys, who is the one that definitely excites you the most heading in? Oh, Hugo. Yeah. <laughs> Hugo, Hugo, without, Hugo a without a doubt. Yeah. Tyler, what about you, man? I, I think the popular answer is going to be Viovich, but our, I, I just really, I'm, I'm on the Hugo train too. And I'm not just being nice to Raphael. I, I uh, just, the way he plays the game, I feel like he's going to be a guy that all of a sudden is going to heat up and throw his name into the first round. It just seems like a guy that could blossom with his new uh, his new league. So he's going to be the guy I'm watching. Beautiful. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of the podcast. Raphael, thank you so much again for coming on the show. One more time for my audience, please let everyone know where they can find you on social media and find what you're working on for the 2022 draft cycle. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. I've enjoyed the opportunity to talk basketball. You can find me on NBA uh, draftjunkies.com, Also my YouTube channel and my, my podcast. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and announce it here. I'm usually someone that waits to announce things just in case there's a worst case scenario. But I deeper want- exclusive. I love it, man. <laughs> Hit me with it. So I am uh, planning to to spend the majority of this basketball season in Europe. So I'm, I'm heading out this week. I'll start off in France at the Asvel versus um, Paris basket game. So that game will feature um, Wimbayama, uh, another guy that's a prospect for this year's draft uh, coming out of France, Kam- um, Kamagadi, uh, I- Ishmael Kamagadi. Yes, I want to hear those thoughts. I'm excited to see that. I love that. Okay. And then uh, the Celtics draft and stash guy, Wuhan Bagaran, is, is also on the Paris basket team. So that'll be the first game. And then from Paris, I plan on going to Madrid. And I'm going to document it. I'm going to create like a vlog of just my whole experience of trying to navigate my way 
traveling through trains and and just trying to, you know, um, find the next international prospect. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So, um, so yeah, you got the, the, the draft deeper exclusive. <laughs> please, please share all those videos with me so I can share the hell out of them on this platform. I'm going to be so excited to watch those and see your scouting journey unfold this year. That's absolutely incredible what you're doing, man. But with that being said, that's going to do it for this episode of the podcast. If you aren't following us already on Twitter, make sure you're doing so at Draft Deeper. Not only following this podcast platform on Twitter, but our no ceilings operation with Tyler, with everybody at the Draft Act, Corey and Albert, with Tyler Metcalf. So many people involved in this operation. I want to make sure that you're following them on Twitter, us, I should say, at No Ceilings NBA to make sure you're getting updates constantly when, when pieces are going live. Make sure you're subscribed to the Substack. You can find all of those links across all of our social media channels as well, especially if you are following the No Ceilings account on Twitter. And then make sure you're subscribed to this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also find links for everybody else's podcast on the No Ceilings Podcast Network through the link tree that we have set up for that. Again, that's L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash No Ceilings MBA is where you can find links to not just this podcast, but also, again, Backcourt Violation, the Draft Deck, NBA Deep Dives. You can find the most latest content, the latest episodes of all of these podcasts at that link tree. Pretty cool thing that we have going on right there. But yeah, I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your week. We're only one week out, everyone. We're one week out. Tuesday, November 9th is when we're kicking off the college season. We'll have plenty of content leading up to that, and I'm going to be doing a reaction piece to the Champions Classic, specifically with Corey Teleba over at the Substack. So make sure you're subscribed to No Ceilings. Have a wonderful rest of your week, everyone. 